Okay. Welcome everyone um, to our uh, alumni spotlight series for November, October. Uh, I'm so excited to um, welcome everybody today. So excited that you're engaged with us on, uh, on Zoom today. Um, Let's see, my name is Ellen Still, and I am Emmanuel's Director of Alumni Engagement. If you've not done so already, please add your name and class here on screen. If you're not an Emmanuel alum, please note your school or company, thank you. After Dr. Sutherland's presentation, we'll have a casual and open discussion. I encourage everyone to take turns adding to that discussion. Please bear with us as we get into a rhythm and please remain on mute unless you are speaking. Questions uh, during the talk can be submitted through the chat or Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to raise your hand if you'd like as well. Uh, let's see, hold on. I just wanna make check that waiting room and make sure nobody's, there we go, we're good, we're good. So we are so excited to present the October, November installment of our 2023 Emanuel College Alumni Spotlight Series. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Sutherland, James is a public policy researcher and government affairs professional with over 10 years of experience working in the nonprofit and government sectors. As Associate Vice President of Public Policy and Advocacy, James leads the Aquarium's federal, state, and local advocacy and government relations efforts. Prior to joining the Aquarium, James was the Director of Policy and Research for the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce and the Research Director for then Boston City Councilor, now Congresswoman, Ayanna Presley, and a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Northeastern University. James is a graduate of Emanuel College with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and earned his Master's and Doctorate in Political Science from Northeastern University. A native of the San Francisco Bay Area, James now lives in Dorchester and is an avid skier, tennis player, and natural wine enthusiast. Welcome, James. We're so happy that you're with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen. It's so great to be here today, and thank you, everyone, for uh, participating today. Um, so as Ellen mentioned, I'm a 2011 graduate of Emanuel College. Um, I spent some great years uh, there. Uh, I was on the volleyball team. Uh, actually. Got my first internship in Boston through my volleyball coach, which happened to be in um, then city councilor Ayanna Presley's office. So my experience at Emanuel really kind of kickstarted my my career uh, in Boston politics and public policy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and hopefully everyone can see that. If not, please uh, wave at me or something. <laughs> Um, so I want to get started by actually talking about um, the aquarium a little bit. Um, if you went to Emanuel College, you most likely know about the New England Aquarium. Um, since our founding 54 years ago, we've been a nonprofit ocean conservation organization uh, with a vision for a vital and vibrant ocean for future generations. And we do this work across what we call four pillars of impact. Uh, a lot of folks know us for the work in our main building. Um, be it the penguins they come visit, the sea turtles, um, you name it. But we, we do quite quite a bit of work outside of that as well. Um, so those four pillars are first advancing in animal and ocean health. And this means we use science to study and solve problems facing habitats, species, uh, individual animals, both in our care and in the wild. Um, the second is promoting responsible use of our ocean, um, which at its core ensures uh, ensuring ocean use includes a balanced conservation focus. Um, so, for example, we do some work uh, with industry partners in aquaculture and offshore wind. Uh, we run a blue tech incubator, um, all kinds of things. Uh, third is to inspire and develop ocean advocates, uh, which is what happens every time someone walks through our doors. Um, we want to create a space that um, people can understand and appreciate the ocean and then act to protect it. And the fourth um, it is a new one for us as an aquarium. Uh, is partnering to build resilient communities, which means we support the sustainability of coastal communities like Boston uh, to understand, plan for, withstand, and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, this expands beyond that to our work with DEI and our work building workforce pipelines in the field. Um, so I'm very excited to kind of talk to you a little bit about my work um, around climate change and ocean conservation. And if you have one takeaway from today, um, that is that the fight against climate change is about more than reducing emissions. It's about more than resilient infrastructure. Um, we need to be thinking about the ocean. 
Uh, we need to be thinking about ocean solutions or blue solutions just as much as we're talking green. Uh, so a lot of the kind of um, kind of wording that people use, they're so focused on green, like green new deal. We need a blue new deal. Um, but so we're, we're focusing on the ocean today and the role that that plays in uh, climate change. So yes, mitigation and resiliency are important and I'm gonna to touch on those, uh, but there are so many other factors at play. And uh, I'm kind of gonna divide this up into um, our climate work into species and spaces buckets. So species, the animals themselves and spaces, the ecosystems um, that they call home. And first, uh, we're gonna talk spaces. And the aquarium faces the impact of climate change literally every day in our work, uh, from the research in the ocean to our home on Central Wharf. Um, so this pictures here are from 2018, some of the king tide storms that we uh, saw, but they could have been easily this year. Um, we see sunny day flooding. Um, we have a very vulnerable, climate vulnerable building. Um, if you think about how you build an aquarium, you need a ton of water. We're, we're located right on the harbor and we were designed to take water in. We wanted to take water from the harbor to um, put into our exhibits, which is great for an aquarium built in 1969, but not great for an aquarium facing climate change and resiliency issues. So our building floods already, um, and that's kind of how we're starting to approach this from the inside out. A lot of our life care systems and whatnot are in our basement, which floods every month. Um, so we're doing a ton of work on resiliency right now, both for ourselves, um, but also for the broader communities across Massachusetts. And in Boston in particular, um, we're promoting the use of district-wide comprehensive resiliency planning. Um, if you look at this map of downtown Boston, um, you'll see a lot of piers jetting out into the water, a lot of property along the coast. Um, if you can see right here where my mouse is, that is uh, Central Wharf, where New England Aquarium calls home. And if you'll see these orange lines, those are the current flood points, uh, the entry point. So a building like ours on Central Wharf, the flood point is actually inland. Um, it's not along the water line, which necessitates comprehensive planning. We need to be able to rely on our neighbors and the resiliency measures that they put into place to also protect us. So we need comprehensive planning um, to do that. At the same time, looking at this map, you might be thinking, where will that resiliency infrastructure go? And there's no there's no land, it's just water. Um, so the other kind of aspect that we're working on right now is on the regulatory side. And I'll get into that in a minute, um, but really you need to be able to build in the water sheet um, to promote resiliency. And as an ocean conservation organization, that is quite something to say, uh, let's build in the water. Um, but that's that's the point that we're at right now. So we're working on a number of bills um, in the legislature, both the state and federal up in Congress uh, this session. And one is on this uh, issue in particular, and it's called an act to facilitate climate resiliency. And we filed this bill with some other coastal legislators um, to really promote the use of nature-based solutions in Massachusetts. Um, and this bill amends two statutes uh, to promote climate resiliency projects because by their very nature, Coastal resiliency projects need to be constructed in our coastal areas. Right now, there are a ton of regulatory uh, permitting issues in Massachusetts that prevent basically any resiliency structure from getting built in the water. Um, the Wetlands Protection Act, the Public Waterfront Act, um, they both establish regulations for good purpose to protect our waterways. Um, but when it comes to needing protection from climate change, we, we have a lot of work to do. So those two statutes um, work to regulate our coastlines and we're working to amend those to ensure that ecological restoration projects, nature-based solution, uh, resiliency projects have a fast permitting track. Um, because right now when they're essentially illegal, um, it's, it's very difficult to get anything, uh, anything done, anything funded through all of the buckets of money the federal government has been giving out in this space. Um, it makes it very difficult to do any of that. So resiliency is a big issue we're facing and one that we're looking to tackle head on. On the flip side um, of resiliency is the mitigation issue and carbon emissions. And we're working on this as well at the state level because our global ocean plays a critical role in climate mitigation. Um, it sequesters or absorbs carbon 
Um, and upwards of 30% of excess carbon in our atmosphere is actually absorbed by the ocean. So folks, think of the process of trees kind of eating up carbon from the atmosphere. The ocean does the same thing. Marshlands, wetlands do the same thing. And they're actually more productive at it than forests. Um, so we need to do more to protect these zones, which in kind of the climate um, space are called blue carbon zones. Uh, protecting blue carbon to ensure that we can use those spaces um, to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. Um, so our bill that we're working with uh, some legislators on actually enhances their role uh, by setting a net positive goal for blue carbon zones in Massachusetts. So right now we have a goal of no net loss. Let's not lose any of these zones in Massachusetts. The aquarium instead is saying, let's build more of them. We need more protected areas, wetlands, seagrass, salt marshes, to not only sequester carbon from the atmosphere, but also to serve as a, a resiliency mechanism. Uh, these are critical um, sort of features in our landscape that help protect us from rising sea levels. So very important. Another issue we're working on is ocean acidification. Uh, which I just mentioned the global ocean absorbed upwards of 30% uh, excess carbon in the atmosphere. But that process doesn't happen in a vacuum. As the chemical reactions that occur from increasing carbon levels mixed with things like nutrient pollution from farms, roadways, and whatnot, our ocean is actually becoming more acidic, the ocean acidification. And that harms marine ecosystems, that harms species, um, and the state's blue or ocean economy. Um, in particular, ocean acidification is harmful to marine uh, species such as shellfish, uh, clams, oysters, scallops, mussels, lobsters, and their ability to maintain healthy and protective shells. If you know anything about Massachusetts' blue economy, you know that we are heavily dependent on shellfish uh, for our seafood economy. And in fact, Massachusetts actually has the second highest number of seafood industry-related jobs in the country behind only California. So this has a huge kind of risk factor for both our economy and our uh, species. And uh, a 2021 report put out by the state legislature actually said that ocean acidification, or Massachusetts will be disproportionately impacted by ocean acidification. And that's due to our reliance on coastal environments and coastal ecosystem and uh, economies. So our bill is actually looking to implement some um, mechanisms to help alleviate those pressures. And uh, the first actually um, creates an ocean acidification commission in the state of Massachusetts um, to help understand and uh, address the threats posed by ocean acidification to our waters. So how can we have uh, intervening measures? How can we develop and best adaptive practices? How can we be monitoring our waters uh, for acidification? It also, uh, the other bill we're working on is a blue communities bill. Um, which outlines nine initiatives that communities across Massachusetts can take. We have 351 cities and towns. Um, so initiatives they can take to reduce nutrient pollution and its impact on aquatic habitats. Um, so this is a huge issue we're gonna start hearing more and more about, particularly here in Massachusetts. Um, we're already starting to experience some of it on Cape Cod. Um, well, you'll see, you, won't, you might not hear it called ocean acidification, but you will start seeing uh, stories and there's one in WBUR uh, this past week or two about shells off of Cape Cod. So it's, it's a huge issue that we're facing. Moving to some of the more species specific work um, that we're doing right now, uh, I wanna take a look at the Gulf of Maine, which is the body of water extending from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and the coast of Maine. Um, it's a large kind of body of water that right off of our coast, um, houses a number of the species that call uh, New England home. It's home to future offshore wind turbines. Um, it's home to a variety of different things. And since the early 1980s, as you can see in this chart, the rate of warming in the Gulf of Maine has more than has been more than triple the world average for our ocean. So um, we're talking 86, 0.86 degrees Fahrenheit per decade for the Gulf of Maine versus 0.27 uh, for the global ocean. And there's research being done on what's causing this, um, these sort of sustained warming conditions, but they suggest uh, major ocean currents are shifting, in particular the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Current, uh, which meet in the Gulf of Maine. Um, the Gulf of Maine in 2022 
uh, retain the region's distinction as being one of the fastest warming ocean regions on the planet. Uh, with 2022 data showing that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 97% of the world's ocean surface. We've heard a lot about warming waters lately in Florida um, and some of the impacts that that's having on uh, coral down there and other species, um, but has a ton of impact up here in Massachusetts as well. We're not facing quite the level that they are down there, um, but I believe we saw the ninth warmest summer uh, for ocean waters in recorded history. So how does this impact species? Um, and what kind of work are we doing to address that? First are sea turtles. Uh, sea turtles are facing a growing number of threats due to climate change and a number of other issues. Um, all known sea turtle species within the United States waters are listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. With rising temperatures in the Gulf of Maine, uh, sea turtles are act actually extending their historic habitats further and further into Cape Cod Bay. Um, if you know anything about the geography of Cape Cod Bay, you know it looks like a, an arm. And when they travel further and further into Cape Cod Bay and waters change with temperature with the season as it becomes winter, more and more are actually getting trapped or stranded on Cape Cod beaches. Um, they become incapacitated, basically hypothermic, um, and need intervention in order to survive. Currently, there's federal programs that exist to support conservation of marine mammals, like whales, porpoises, seals, um, and they've gotten to the tune of over $67 million over the past 20 years for those efforts. But institutions that do work to help rescue sea turtles um, right now receive little to no federal funding. Um, so the aquarium is looking to change that. We actually have a sea turtle hospital uh, in Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, where we um, treat rehabil and rehabilitate sea turtles each and every year, um, and then ship them off either down south um, through a nonprofit called Turtles Fly 2 uh, to be released based on the time of year. Sometimes we release them off the Cape. It really depends on the time of the year. Um, but we're working with Senator Ed Markey and Representative Bill Keating, um, the two Massachusetts members of Congress, um, to create a new grant program and the Department of Commerce to fund the rescue, recovery, and research of sea turtles in the United States. Um, and this bill uh, was filed last session, uh, made it to the floor of the House of Representatives before the end of session, um, so did not pass last year, but we did get our first ever federal funding in the uh, federal budget last year for sea turtle rescue. Um, we're moving headstrong this year um, on the bill as well, and uh, despite having no Speaker of the House, um, it did have a committee markup this week and was unanimously pushed forward um, in the House. And we're expecting a similar um, action in the Senate uh, in the weeks to come. So we're very excited about that because the number of cold sun turtles is rapidly increasing each and every year as climate change changes our temperatures, water temperatures, and habitats for these sea turtles. As you'll see in this chart here, um, we went from an average of 40, 50, 100 sea turtles every season to upwards of over 700, 1,000 each year. Um, the aquarium actually used to do marine mammal rescue. Um, so for whales, uh, porpoises, stuff like that, we had to stop. Uh, we did not have the capacity given the number of sea turtles that were coming into our sea turtle hospital each year. So that's a huge kind of impact that climate change is having directly on species and ecosystems here in Massachusetts. A second species I wanna talk about is the North Atlantic right whale. Um, it is one of the world's most endangered large whale species. It is listed as critically endangered, and it's actually Massachusetts state official marine mammal. Uh, if you're still living in Massachusetts, you probably recognize it on some of our license plates. Um, they, there's a special license plate with them um, that you'll see going around um, streets of Massachusetts. Right whales migrate seasonally, um, and in the spring, summer, and fall, many of these can be found in foraging waters in New England. Um, so each fall, They'll then travel upwards of a thousand miles south to the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, um, to their calving grounds. So they're highly mobile. Um, they're actually nicknamed the urban whale for their tendency to stay close to the shore. They're very docile, slow, have a high blubber content, and often skim the surface. So these behaviors actually made them a perfect target for commercial whalers, um, which by the early 1890s, had hunted North Atlantic right whales nearly to extinction. And 
in fact, folks thought they were extinct up until the 1980s. While whaling is no longer a threat, they have never recovered to their pre-whaling numbers. And human interactions still present the greatest danger to this species, uh, namely entanglements in fishing gear and vessel strikes. So some news from this week, the aquarium actually leads the North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium, um, which is meeting in Halifax, Nova Scotia uh, yesterday and today. And as part of its annual conference, it releases the annual population estimate for the species. Um, using our most up-to-date data, our scientists kind of put together estimates of where the, the population count looks like. And for 2022, that population count is 356 individuals worldwide, with about anywhere between 70 to 90 uh, reproductive age females. Um, good news from this report, despite the low numbers, is the downward trajectory for the species may be slowing. Uh, we might be turning a curve here, as you'll see kind of a flattening of the, the curve here. Um, but it's still heavily critically endangered. Um, as I mentioned, entanglements in fishing gear uh, and vessel strikes are the leading causes of North Atlantic right whale mortality, um, but those aren't the only issues they face. Um, increasing ocean noise, um, climate change, all sorts of things are impacting them. Um, and each and every year we see more and more deaths of this species. So to date, uh, New England Aquarium analysis has detected 32 human caused injuries to right whales in 2023 alone, including six fishing gear entanglements with attached gear, 24 entanglement injuries with no attached gear and two vessel strikes. So for a population of 356 individuals, 32 of them have faced an injury in 2023 alone because of humans. So that's a huge issue that we're facing with and climate change is only exacerbating it. So what are we doing to attempt to tackle it? First on entanglements, um, traditional fishing gear uses vertical ropes and can entangle non-target species like sea turtles and whales, resulting in trauma and even death. Um, once these species are entangled, um, they can face very severe injuries, which result in difficulties feeding, energy loss, um, and a number of other impacts that has made some females not be able to reproduce. Um, New England Aquarium Research in 2022 um, not only found that entanglements are the leading cause of serious injury and death for this species, but that 86% of identified right whales have been entangled at least once. 86% is a high, high number. Uh, luckily, fishers and conservationists and researchers are working together to develop on-demand fishing gear as a solution that can protect marine species while supporting our flourishing um, marine economy. It doesn't exactly remove the rope from the water, uh, but instead minimizes the amount of rope used, thereby reducing entanglement risk. And essentially, um, it's almost on an on-demand. It's you can use an app. You have a map-based kind of system to identify where you have dropped traps on the bottom of the ocean floor. And then once you're in the area, that you can then activate those traps to pop up to the surface. Um, so very minimal use of rope uh, rope time in the water. Biggest issue facing us right now is the cultural attachment to some of the traditional fishing gear, um, but another major problem facing the transition to on-demand gear is the cost, which is upwards of $8,000 per unit and rendering it inaccessible to many uh, fisheries found in the Gulf of Maine. Um, this bill that we're working on um, would create a state grant program to provide funding assistance for the research development and acquisition of this gear. Um, we're hoping that by eliminating at least a portion of the cost burden, um, our fisheries will be willing to make that transition to on-demand gear and better assist with efforts to save species like the right whale. Second kind of issue that we talked about a little bit already are vessel strikes. Um, and the big kind of issue we're working on right now has to do with speed limit. So I know every driver loves a speed limit on the roads. Um, we got them in the water too. Um, so vessel strikes are our primary target our primary threat for the species. And agencies like NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, at the federal level, are attempting to implement an updated vessel speed rule, um, which attempts to reduce the risk of these species getting struck by, by vessels. And as I mentioned, these are very kind of docile creatures. They love to float on the surface. They don't have a dorsal fin, which makes them very difficult to identify. Um, and they hug the coast, 
where most of the boat traffic is. So they're they're very susceptible to vessel strikes. Um, NOAA put out their proposed rule. We're waiting on a final rule to be issued, um, but it actually calls for some new speed restrictions in Massachusetts in the Gulf of Maine. Um, as you'll see here, they're time-based based on when right whales are in the area. Um, and these rules under the current rules apply to 65 foot vessels and more. Um, NOAA's proposed new rule would be 35 feet. The speed that um, would be required is 10 knots an hour, which 10 knots is pretty slow <laughs> if you're out on the water. It's um, prohibitively slow for some, especially within our ocean economy sectors. Um, you think of some of the industries that have to use the ocean, um, they often are the ones that are pushing back on speed restrictions like this. So um, recreational fishing, commercial fishing are ones that we're, we're um, negotiating with, but it, it's been quite difficult. I think the other kind of big thing here is our current vessel speed is, man is voluntary. The updated rule would make it mandatory. So a lot of folks are very hesitant um, to be supportive of this rule because of the impact it will have on all sorts of um, aspects of our, our industry, be it ferries, be it fishing, be it the construction of offshore wind, you name it. So we're, we're keeping an eye out on this. It's the, again, a big threat facing the right whale. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of issues in tackling kind of the solution. A separate industry that may be impacted by this that I already mentioned is offshore wind. Late last week, uh, the Bureau of Ocean uh, Energy Management announced a draft wind energy area in the Gulf of Maine. Um, it's roughly 3.5 million acres and ranges from 23 to 120 miles off the coasts of Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. Um, if you recall the last slide, you'll see some overlaps with our vessel speed rule, um, meaning that during certain times of year, developers might have to go 10 knots an hour out to um, offshore wind fields, which raises the price of having to do build offshore wind. Um, so there's a number of issues in that space. But I did want to talk a little bit more about the work we're doing in um, offshore wind because climate change necessitates renewable energy like offshore wind, um, as it's the biggest issue facing marine species and ecosystems. At the same time, climate change is altering traditional migratory paths, of species like the North Atlantic right whale, um, which are now more prevalent in our southern New England wind lease areas, which you'll see in the dark brown uh, south of Massachusetts and Rhode Island on this map. Um, places that weren't habitats when these maps, that area was originally drawn, are becoming more and more likely to be right whale habitats because of migratory pattern changes induced by climate change. So where we actually can construct offshore wind um, is dynamic uh, based on some of these habitat issues that we're facing. So what does New England Aquarium do in this space? Mm -hmm. uh, we've been actually um, conducting research and monitoring in the Massachusetts and Rhode Island wind lease areas for over a decade to understand the distribution and abundance of the animals uh, that cause or that call this space home. We do this in a few different ways. Um, we have aerial surveys that we do to um, track species that hug the top of the water, so typically marine mammals, sea turtles, we also use passive acoustic telemetry techniques. Um, think of if you're driving in Massachusetts and going through a toll booth, an easy pass, uh, we kind of ding on the system. Same thing, same idea for telemetry. Um, we have tagged species that basically easy pass by uh, the wind lease areas and we can track what species are going by them. So we do this with a number of highly migratory fishes, sharks, tunas, marlins, um, to really ensure Kind of what, or to better understand the habitat that they call home and their pathways through it. We use this research to inform public policies and industry practices um, to ensure that they avoid, minimize, or mitigate any harm to species and habitats. It's a, it's a big conflict space, um, but one that we recognize needs to happen. Um, offshore wind is a solution to our climate crisis and Climate change as the biggest threat facing these species um, is something that we need to approach. So our research contributes to the information needed to aid um, the renewable energy community in developing offshore wind in a responsible manner and to address the multiple interacting stressors placed on species. So ocean noise, ocean traffic, pollution, um, and whatnot. So 
we use this information to really kind of inform developers on what time of year should pile driving occur? Um, where should pile driving occur? Where should we put transmission lines from offshore wind uh, terminals to the coastline so that they don't fall over um, certain ecosystems that are uh, incredibly important to some of the species that call these regions home? So a lot of kind of interesting questions that we're dealing with um, really at the heart of climate change issues and ocean conservation issues. I covered a lot of ground. <laughs> We're doing quite a bit of work in this space. Um, but to wrap, really, combating climate change is, more, again, more about reducing emissions and addressing rising sea levels. Its impacts range much further than most realize. And while we can leverage the ocean as a solution, uh, a climate solution, we also have a responsibility to do much more and to conserve both it and the species that call it home. Um, so I thank you all for attending. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, James. That was amazing. I think you can, um, if you stop sharing your screen, we can do a, a gallery and that way everybody can see each other. Thank you. So um, I think one of the, the you know, all that information is so powerful, but the, the one of the slides at the beginning where the, the ocean was just coming up to the aquarium sidewalks, and the tea stop and, and all those things. I mean, I think to to make it really personal to, to Boston and, and this area, I mean, what are the projections in terms of like, you know, when is this, when is that tipping point going to happen where, you know, they, they this, your facility, the, you know, the New England Aquarium is no longer going to be able to function because they're so far underwater, which, you know, as you said, you rely on the ocean location to replenish tanks and, and kind of be a partner with the, the sea level right there. But, you know, when is that, when does that become a, a real, real, real problem that you can't just mitigate? I mean, it, it's a problem now. Yeah. Um, we're always talking about this as an urgent issue because it's so far out in our minds. That we're like, oh, we have next year. We have next year, but next year is coming. And 20 years from now, we're gonna um, wish we had started 20 years earlier. So it's an issue now. Um, there are spaces on Long Wharf right across uh, the next wharf over from us that you'd think you were in Venice um, with the sea level so that they see. They, they have a plan in place for moving all of their restaurant chairs and tables to their second floor um, when the king tides are coming in because they're used to just sweeping the water out. So they're they're impacted, their business, day-to-day -day business is already impacted. Same with ours. Our life support systems are, a lot of our mechanicals are in our basement now. And so that's a risk um, that we're facing, looking to actively address. Um, we're talking about, uh, we're going actually undergoing a campus planning effort um, to figure out what's the best direction for our campus, um, given the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. I'm sure we'll see um, things like the harbor walk that surrounds our building have to be raised. Um, we'll have to um, think creatively about the harbor. I mean, we're, we're lucky that we have the Boston Harbor Islands. They um, act to as a buffer for some of the, the heavier uh, storm surge, but we can, we can install our own wave attenuation islands uh, out in the water sheet as a nature-based solution um, that also welcomes people to their waterfront. So right. There's a lot of solutions here, um, but it, it, it's an urgent one. It's an urgent one. Well, of course, that translates to money. I mean, that's the first thing that you think about in, in you know, increasing the size of that harbor walk is not, you know, that's not a drop in the bucket. And and creating a, another barrier island is not another, you know, that's not a drop in the bucket. And so it's it's one of those things that, you know, and these things take time in terms of proposals and bills and money and things like that. So again, you know, you said it perfectly that you'll, people will say, we wish we started this 20 years ago. Um, and, and so that, that kind of brings me to one of my other questions. And then please feel free, um, folks, as, as you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself um, or submit a question in the, in the chat if you're, if you don't want to speak on, on the Zoom. But, um, you know, you talked about kind of creating these marshlands and creating these mangroves and, and these types of things. How do you, how do, how do you even go about doing that? I mean, is that something that, you know, is it, is you just kind of take over something that's already there, you know, that it, 
it's a mystery to me how something like that gets built. Yeah, it kind of depends on the location. I mean, we have uh, salt marshes off of Logan Airport in East Boston that most folks don't know about. So it's about protecting those spaces and expanding them um, where they already exist. Um, but nature is always changing. I mean, you go out onto the Cape, you'll see all the sand dunes out there that are changing every single year. So we have to do um, yeah. quite a bit of work. It's, it's ongoing work um, to not only protect those spaces, but to also expand them. Um, so ensuring that they do have those protections um, and kind of environmental protections around them um, is super, super important. Um, right. I think on top of that is just how industry mixes with some of these spaces. Um, the kind of biggest, the biggest blue economy sector in Massachusetts is our tourism economy, and they're heavily reliant on the coastline. Um, but at the same time, other industries are looking to use the coastlines as well, and the spaces that necessitate sort of to be blue carbon zones. So it, it's a lot to do that. <laughs> um, it, it'll be regulatory. It'll be just pure um, grit doing it, um, expanding some of these spaces. If anybody has a question, feel free to unmute, raise your hand, whatever you would like. I'm looking, I'm looking, because I've got a million questions, but I don't want to. <laughs> I actually want to bring up something from your, your last question about resiliency issues. And um, one of the big challenges that we're also facing beyond sort of the regulatory and permitting is who owns land? So next to us is Long Wharf. Um, if you're familiar with the Boston area, there's a Marriott Log Wharf um, on the on the pier, and you can hop on whale watch cruises and whatnot from that pier. Uh, the wharf has four owners: the Marriott, which I already mentioned, the City of Boston, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the United States government. So three political entities and one private entity own one wharf. Out of all, we have so many other wharfs to worry about in Boston, but just pick that one. You have four owners that likely can't agree on anything. And how do you sort of build a resiliency plan with so many kind of disparate parties, different factions? So it's, there's so much more to some of this than people realize. <laughs> um, and that, that's kind of what keeps me up at night. I mean, absolutely. That's stuff that should keep, keep be keeping us all awake. I mean, not necessarily Long Wharf, but, you know, the, the types of damage that we're doing and the types of mitigation efforts that it's going to take to combat that. The um, I know that the just as a really small example compared to the offshore wind establishment that you were talking about referencing in the Gulf of Maine, um, you know, I know Cape Wind went through so many hurdles and, you know, it took years and years to get that going. And so I can't, and that was on a much, much smaller scale, just off the coast of Massachusetts. So then when you do an entire, you know, Northeast um, wind farm per se, it, again, so many mitigating agencies. I mean, when would you, let's say everything goes okay. Let's say everything gets approved. I mean, when would that even start? When would, you know, it, we, it we have seems, pilings in the ground. Um, really? Vineyard, Vineyard Wind put their first pilings in the ground a couple months ago. So mm -hmm. they're, they're getting started, but there still are a ton of regulatory hurdles. Um, there's environmental hurdles. I mean, I spent a good chunk of time talking about the right whale, um, but that species is actually getting weaponized uh, to fight against offshore wind, um, saying that we need to protect the whale, which means no offshore wind. Um, and actually, we're, we're seeing some oil and gas interests backing um, those campaigns. And it, it's unfortunate because we are also a, a right whale uh, conservation organization uh, with a very different vantage point in one based in science. Um, and it's it's been kind of a struggle to approach some of that because we're not going to make everyone happy. I mean, we're just we're there to lend the science um, and let that speak for itself. Right, right. Um any other questions right now? I don't, I, <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things that, that um, well, we had a question about was, is um, speaking to cities that have taken on sea level rise effectively that Boston could essentially learn from, is that something that, that you can speak to? Yeah, so, I mean, everyone points to Amsterdam. So I'm not gonna point to Amsterdam, but they've done a good job at it. Um, one that actually is, I know New York City's done some good stuff. 
Um, we had a, a site visit there a couple years back to see some of the resiliency projects they're doing. Um, but the other is actually Seattle. Um, they actually are just redoing their um, entire waterfront. Um, we actually did a visit to the Seattle Aquarium earlier this year to also check out the resiliency measures that they're putting in place along the Seattle waterfront. Um, and what's kind of cool about that is they're also ensuring that it remains a place that people want to be. Um, right now, you think of kind of the Harbor Walk in downtown Boston. Different words come to mind, touristy, um, inaccessible, um, kind of off limits at some times, kind of walled off by buildings. Seattle's taking the opposite approach. So with their resiliency infrastructure, um, they're using nature-based solutions. They're kind of building it into uh, the day-to-day -day infrastructure because, I mean, not every day is going to be flooding. You're going to be living with this infrastructure day in and day out, even if you're only using it once a month um, or twice a month. So you want to be able to make sure that it's livable and that folks can continue to access that area um, while ensuring it's resilient. And Seattle's doing a great job uh, from what I've seen on that. Well, that's encouraging. And it's it's sometimes those field trips are, you know, so educational. And no, that's very, very important. So with the um going back to kind of the pilings and and um kind of these these mitigation efforts and things like that, I mean the the other factor that comes into play with that is the displacement of you know sand and seabeds and animals there. And and just because you know you're trying to do something good for the environment, I'm sure that there's an environmental factor that comes into play with protests and things like that, because you're you're disturbing the seabed, which is the you know, the, the home to so many different creatures. And so, um, and I know that, you know, in Naples, Florida, they were doing a, a large project where they were bringing sand from the ocean onto the beach to kind of reinforce the beaches down there. And again, disturbing millions of animals and, and lives in the process from, you know, animals that you can see to microscopic animals. So, um, you know, what, what do you say when, when that question comes up? Um, I'm not heavily involved in this space, um, so can't speak super informed about it, um, but I do can speak to some of the stuff I've heard from uh, some of the scientists on our team um, about this, and they're, they're actively researching this as well, um, and they're wondering about how it impacts biodiversity, and actually it might impact it in a positive way, um, because you're creating some structure on the ocean floor. Um, that creates some protective areas uh, for some of these species. So yeah, the actual installation of itself might be damaging, but once it's there, there might be some biodiversity aspects of it that folks hadn't really considered. Um, but I can't really speak too much to that, um, just not being being the scientist there. I know one other kind of similar issue is with the transmission cables. So actually getting the energy onto land. Um, you think of power lines outside your house, you're gonna have power lines running through the ocean. So ensuring where those cables are laid isn't going over important coral beds, it's not going over important um, kind of habitats for benthic species that hug the bottom of the, the ocean. Um, that's something that we're actively monitoring as well. Yeah, I mean, exactly, because in trying to create a more sustainable energy source, you don't wanna be doing damage as well. Right, Correct. so Correct. it looks like Brian had a question. Brian, feel, please feel free to unmute, thank you. Hey James, how are you? Um, Doing well. Thanks so much uh, for doing this. Um, I have a couple of questions, and one is obviously being located in Boston. How much is the aquarium tapping into the huge network of colleges and universities um, from a partnership standpoint? Um, so that's my first question, and then my second one has to do with an unhealthy fear of sharks. So we could get to that one. On the first one, we do quite a bit of partnering um, with organizations in a few different ways. Um, on the research side, we have partnerships with UMass Boston, uh, UMass Dartmouth, URI, uh, a lot of the coastal um, institutes that are doing ocean research. Um, there's a number of them that we work with. We actually have some folks that teach at some of these universities. We have some of the grad students there working at the aquarium. So it's a pretty combined effort um, with a lot of them. So there's, there's a good amount of partnership there. 
And then the actual growing space for partnership that we're looking at is we're setting up a, an apprenticeship program um, at the aquarium to help diversify some of our roles and serve as a, a workforce pipeline for other um, other jobs. So we're, we're targeting our aquarist roles, um, which are those that kind of, you think of a zookeeper and um, kind of a, I guess, a, kind of a habitat that they take care of. Same idea, aquarists take care of a tank. Um, and so we're looking to partner with some universities on that um, that are getting into that space, um, but also because a lot of the skills you learn doing that uh, you can use in a lab uh, so that you can transfer into the healthcare industry or elsewhere um, because of those transferable skill sets you develop. Fantastic. And then have you seen any sort of, a, and uh, I'm asking this question because I have no idea what the answer is. Um, you know, are any of the colleges or universities adding, I'm going to say, certificate type programs as well um, in your space? Um, uh, and or how are you sort of uh, helping students who don't otherwise uh, have a predisposition maybe to uh, the ocean or to ocean life uh, and to all that you do um, get introduced to it? Good questions. Um, on the certificate, not that I'm aware of, though I know some offshore wind programs are developing and those yeah. will have some ocean conservation kind of um, educational content with them, but nothing kind of specific in that vein. Um, on the other one about how we start um, kind of inspiring folks to to get into this field. Um, I didn't cover all the legislation that we're working on this session. We actually did file a bill on this. Um, it would allow for high schools across Massachusetts um, to develop um, kind of workplace learning opportunities. So internships, apprenticeships, uh, field trips, school, uh, job visits, stuff like that um, in kind of the ocean tech space, in the, what we're calling the blue steam space. Um, and specifically, those investments we're targeting for state-defined environmental justice populations. So a number of those populations are on the coast, um, but a number of them aren't. So how can we get some of the folks from Western Mass, some of the folks uh, Central Mass that have no access to the ocean, um, how can we get them inspired to do that? So we're, we're looking to do that through curriculum. Um, the other thing I'll mention is we're actually in the process of trying to develop a climate classroom, um, which would be mobile, It'd be an EV kind of RV type thing, um, probably virtual reality based um, that we can then drive across the Commonwealth to high schools, to middle schools, whatnot, um, to get them that access to the ocean without being physically there. Fantastic. And then though, I think it might be my last question. Having grown up spending a lot of time at the aquarium and most of my childhood in the ocean, I have somehow developed a, a, a huge fear of sharks. And I think it's probably since I had children and I saw them as shark food. Um, and there also seems to be an increasing, every year we hear about the fact that the, the number of sharks specifically in Cape Cod, in our waters, uh, right here in Boston, have has grown significantly. Um, is it actually an unhealthy fear of sharks, or am I best staying on land? Because that's their home. It's actually not shark-infested waters. It's people-infested waters. <laughs> they they predominantly don't go after humans. Um, they typically will if they're frightened or if there's a reason for them to. Um, so I wouldn't say you have to avoid the water, um, but it's good to be able to see what's in the water uh, around you. So I wouldn't go too deep personally. Um, but what folks don't realize about the increase in shark population, um, it's actually a conservation success story. And it's not the sharks themselves, it's the seals that call Cape Cod home. The uh, increasing number of seals and kind of the, the conservation efforts for those have been drawing the sharks back to Massachusetts. Um, so the fact that they're coming back is actually a conservation win. Um, despite the impacts that it has on swimmers and uh, whatnot. But we're, we're thrilled to, to see the sharks um, coming back. Thank you so much. I, I remember reading that 
as, as disheartening as it seems that there are more sharks in the water, I do remember reading that, James, that it was because the seal population had grown so much. And and um, but I just remember always hearing that that Massachusetts was too cold. The water was too cold for sharks and that Maine, it was too cold for sharks. But I don't think that's the case anymore, especially it's, with that chart that you gave about the changing. Gulf of Maine. It's changing. So we're actually starting to um, we have the acoustic telemetry that I mentioned, kind of that easy path system. Um, that we track sharks and we're actually starting to ping sharks further and further north. Um, yeah. We do work down in Florida um, and we track a number of the species that hug the Atlantic coast. Um, and we're getting pings further and further north as they chase uh, their prey that's going further and further north. So we do think that has contributed to it as well. Right. Oh. Okay, Jeremy, I've been a natural fear of sharks as well. I think I blame the movie Jaws. Um, Jeremy had a question. Thank you, Jeremy. I just wanted to say before my question, one of my favorite fun facts is that you're actually statistically um, two times more likely to be killed by a vending machine than by a shark, which is fun, <laughs> fun to think about for Brian. So next time you go to the vending machine, just keep that in mind. Um, but my question for you, James, I was just wondering, I think, I think like you alluded to earlier in your presentation, um, I think the Blue New Deal, like you said, is a little more niche and uncovered than a Green New Deal. Do you have resources that you recommend to people that are, I guess, kind of like lay people in this field that um, kind of can keep up to date on legislation you guys are trying to get run through both state and federally and like newsletters or journals and just stuff that people can kind of keep up to date with all this information as it comes in? Yeah, we have we have a newsletter that we put out with a lot of this information. Um, it includes some of our research work, our educational work, um, advocacy work. Um, whatnot, and that you can sign up for that on our website. Um, we're in the process of standing up in an advocacy specific one, um, which for we just launched a new website, and there's going to be an advocacy platform built into it um, so that folks can kind of continue their work uh, in conservation outside of our building and internationally. Um, so we're we're working on that aspect of it, but um, we have it's called Cmail, um, and you can you can sign up for it on the Aquarium's website. Awesome. Thank you so much. I just put the New England Aquarium website in the chat if anybody wants to click on that. There's actually, I didn't realize there was a web, there's a webcam for the giant tank. I will, I, I will put that on because I just find that so relaxing. There's something really relaxing about fish swimming by and and uh, watching a fire. I don't know what it is. It's just that it kind of puts you in the, puts you in the the mode um, okay, if there aren't any more questions, I mean, please feel free. I'm going to give my little ending spiel. And, uh, uh, but please feel free if after I'm done, if you have any questions, um, please feel free again to raise your hand or, or whatever. I, uh, you know, I just want to thank James so much for, for his time, sharing your time and your talent. Uh, we're so grateful and and so uh, you know it's so impressive. We we use this spotlight series to focus on our alums who are using their talents to make a big difference. And I think that that uh, is definitely what James is doing. So a couple housekeeping things. We've got some um, a lot of things coming up. Let's see. I'm going to share the alumni website in the chat there. Um, please feel free to visit that frequently as we are always updating that with new um, items and new events. Um, we In a few weeks, we have our annual Alumni Memorial Mass taking place on Sunday, November 5th at 11 a.m. in the Emanuel College Chapel. That will be followed by a light reception for anybody who's not in the Boston area or cannot make it to campus. That will be live streamed as well. Um, I'm putting the registration link. This is a, an annual event. We remember members of the Emanuel community who have passed during the past year, as well as um, alumni who have passed during the past year. So I just put that registration link in the chat. Um, I also wanted to ask everybody to please mark their calendars for Alumni Weekend 2024. This will be taking, May, taking place May 31st through June 2nd. In addition to special events for class years ending in four and nine, we will also be offering a number of events that are open to all alumni. We like to include everybody. Everybody's invited and welcome to come back to campus to reconnect and celebrate. Information about Alumni Weekend and registration links will be available in early spring 2024. So that's what I have. That's my little spiel. Um, any other parting comments? Any other parting questions? No? We're all on board to uh, help the ocean combat climate change. 
I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a uh, windmill in my backyard, James. <laughs> Steep enough, but <laughs> so any parting thoughts, James, from you or. No, just thank you all for, uh, for participating and um, hope we, I gave you some things to think about. Um, there's, there's just so much happening in this space that um, I know our attention can always get drawn to the next shiny object, but um, it's good to focus on something. Wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you for all your good work on behalf of uh, Tracy. Oh, Tracy's clapping. <laughs> uh, James, if you're in the area, please uh, come by and visit us. Uh, we'll we'll give you some Emmanuel gear and and uh, <laughs> I, I treat you to a cup of coffee. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you everybody for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. It's a beautiful day here in the Boston area. I'm not sure how many more beautiful days we're going to get like this um, in our area. So get outside, enjoy the sunshine, and thanks again for joining us. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.